here, here is my presentation um, based on largely on the history of training fruit in kitchen gardens. Um, going right back to the 16th century, I want you to see the huge, sorry, the huge variety of fruit that was available. Um, this is in, in probably in the Netherlands. Um, there's cherries, there's berries, there's plums, pears, apples, nectarines, um, all of which were, sorry, I can't control this, were um, raised in Northern European gardens, even as long ago as 1563. Um, however, the techniques for um, raising fruit trees were obviously fairly basic. Um, as you'll notice, this says translated out of Dutch by LM, that's Leonard Meager. Um, by Dutch, I think he means foreign language, not necessarily Dutch. Um, and again, it shows very primitive uh, skills of grafting, uh, even again in the 16th, late 16th century. Um, then we come to the Tudor garden again, 16th century. And if you, you can see here that the walls are low enough for people to look over and therefore not really much good for growing tall trained fruit trees. Um, I'm sorry, I can't stop it jumping about. I'm doing this. Even if these are fruit trees, which we don't particularly know, um, I'm trying to, to explain to you the very slow process of actually growing, growing trained fruit in, in, this, in this country in particular. Um, this picture of a, of a fruit tree is actually pretty basic. It's what we might think of as any old fruit tree. Um, again, the technique for pruning is more or less absent, let alone training in any way. And even Jean de la Quintigny, who created the Potager de Loire for um, Louis XIV, was it, in, in, in 1680 in, in France, in Versailles, uh, these pretty basic pruning uh, drawings are really, I think if you were trying to follow them as a gardener, as a practical gardener, you'd find them pretty much useless. However, it did show the interest in, in, in pruning trees. Round about the middle of the early 18th century, um, the Dutch particularly and the French created the dwarf fruit tree by grafting onto uh, paradise stalks. These little trees were immensely popular in, in, uh, in gentlemen's kitchen gardens, at least in England. But again, you can see on the walls, there's nothing like a trained tree. It's just a pretty wild and woolly thing growing there. However, this gentleman here is obviously very proud of his little fruit trees. Again, the first ever um, instructions for fan train trees appeared round about now, again from the Netherlands. Um, nothing much more elaborate than a fan. And then in England, we began to worry a bit more about climate and producing fruit. And from, from now on, it is the climate rather than the training of the tree that um, occupies the gardener's minds. Um, here you can see some screens against a wall um, to protect the trees from frost and cold weather, also from um, marauding birds. Uh, and then uh, we see this rather cunning training of trees 
for taking up the space that these fan train trees have not yet occupied. Um, the, the gardener has planted vines which grow above in the spaces between the trees and above them. Um, th this, this kind of gardening obviously um, became popular around about the 18th century. Um, what's his name who lived in Selbo? Uh, Gilbert, Gilbert White describes his own garden as having a wall planted with trees in this fashion. Um, meanwhile, over in Switzerland, uh, a rather eccentric man called Nicolas Faccio de Duillet uh, decided that um, <coughs> trees needed the most of the sun that they could get, and the best way to do this was to grow them on slopes. Um, this is a complete fantasy. I don't believe it was ever created, but you can see that the trees are growing on these slopes. Um, this this uh, idea was taken up in England um, quite quite enthusiastically. Um, this is in Gwenton in Cornwall. Uh, the logic, of course, of growing a fruit tree on a slope like this is that um, a the branches would all go up vertically in any case, and you'd have a job to peg them down to keep them flat. B, if there was any fruit, it would get extremely muddy. And C, it was easily accessed by mice. Um, there are perfectly good fruit walls here in any case. So I don't know if this was ever used for fruit tree training, but it, I put it in to show you the lengths to which British gardeners were going in order to improve their fruit tree production, not by training, but by protecting from the weather. And then um, the uh, Elizabethans invented the curved wall, which they thought would help to contain the sun's rays as they moved around uh, for longer than if it was a flat wall. In fact, walls became extremely important. And here again, we have a, a, a beautiful serpentine wall made out of cob. Um, again, fruit trees grown on serpentine walls are somewhat demanding because of the curves. And I think gardeners found that once the wind got out of this wall, it would swoosh round into the curves and out again, and cause quite a lot of damage. However, it was all part of the experimentation that was carrying on in the 18th century. And then some bright spark invented the heated wall. This is the wall in section facing south. This is the shed behind, and this is the little furnace with a fire in it. And these are the divided off flues, which were horizontal like uh, serpentine flues. And then for added protection, a glass front was put across across the front of the, the south front of the wall. This was very popular. However, it meant that gardeners had to keep the fires going all night in the frosty weather. Um, in fact, at Tatton, we tried an experiment where we found a heated wall. And as you can see, the um, smoke was pretty prolific. Another reason for putting the kitchen garden as far away from the house as possible. And then, according to legend in Scotland, this garden here was created, it is a sort of lozenge shape, within a rectangular kitchen garden, especially for fruit. The legend is that it was built by Neapoli Neapolitan, Neap Nap Napoleonic prisoners of war. Um, and they were very cunning. They put wooden um, protectors on, at the top of the walls for the sunny side and tiled protectors for the rainy side. And this is obviously a little peach tree. And this garden is still going strong in Loch Ness in Scotland if you're ever lucky enough to visit it. Now, there was a lot of clergymen writing about fruit and vegetables for some reason in the 18th century. This one was a bit of a villain. He invented what he called 
horizontal shelters. Um, these were slates fixed into the wall, projecting a little way out. And the idea was that they would protect the fruit blossom from the descending frosts. I've outlined some of them in red. Um, he published this rather elegant um, illustration to show what he meant in a book. And he had a visit from a man called Mr. Collins, who discovered that he'd only just that very day practically stuck them in with cement, so that in fact they had never been actually tried out. But it goes to the extent, it shows you the extent to which British gardeners were anxious about the weather rather than about the training. I can't see that this tree has had very much training. Uh, they became a bit more sensible with, Victoria, with the Victorian era and decided to put glass shelters hanging on, um, on these struts at the tops of walls to, to help protect their fruit trees. And if you go to Chevening, um, which is unlikely as it's private, <coughs> but if you do go to Chevening, you'll still see these structures at the top of the wall from which these things were hung. In fact, you see them in quite a lot of kitchen gardens in England. And then there was a very ingenious man called Thomas Hitt, who was the Royal Gardener at Kensington. Um, in 1757, he wrote a book um, describing how to grow fruit trees. And he had decided that if the wall went down all the way to the base of the roots, the roots didn't have enough room to spread. So he designed walls with arches, so the roots could go both sides of the wall. And if you're ever excavating a kitchen garden wall, you may sometimes come across these strange arches. However, over in France is really where the art of fruit tree training was taking off. Um, this wonderful, amazing tree of eight branches is just one covering the many, many, many acres of wall in uh, the Portage de Loire in Versailles. And this is the kind of trap you need to keep it in order. Um, indeed, it is to France that we look nowadays for the excellence, excellence in fruit tree training. Uh, I would give a lot to have a garden like this. I'm not so sure about that. It looks like a lot of hard work, but it is very beautiful. Meanwhile, in England, all we cared about really was growing the biggest fruit trees we could possibly manage. Um, if you've ever been to Calain in Scotland, you, you may still see the remains of this amazing fig tree. And again, here is the very important fellow, the gardener. I think we were better in England at indoor fruit. This is the vinery at West Dean, trained by Jim Buckland. Um, absolutely perfect example of fruit tree training, even though it is a vine and not what we usually think of as a fruit apple tree or pear tree. Beautifully trained. And obviously, the better trained it is, the more productive it becomes and the more healthy. Um, English gardeners were very anxious to make the glass houses in which they grew their fruit the right shape for the fruit whereas a vine needed a long, low leaning roof. This is the peach case, which only needed a narrow um, corridor and again, growing fruit both on the back wall and the front. And um, a fruit tree grower named Thomas Rivers, who I'm sure you've all heard of, was very keen on, um, on dwarf fruit. He invented the orchard house, um, making sure that, rather charmingly, that the path down the middle was wide enough for a lady with a crinoline to walk down. But all these trees would have been grown in pots, um, very much dwarfed by the pots. But again, um, quite an entertaining way of growing fruit and very productive. Again, also rather beautiful because you could take the fruit, whole thing pot and all to table and the guests could help themselves from the fruit from the very tree on which it was growing. 
Um, there was a bit of eccentricity going on in England. What on earth persuaded anyone to do this, I don't know. But the remains could still be seen at Croxteth. And then we do have this enormous reverence for our very most ancient fruit trees. Goodness knows how old this apple tree is, and goodness knows how productive it might be. Uh, probably not very. Um, but it does just prove that in England we were capable of producing um, an espalier. And once again, I'm taking you back to Calais, where you can still see the fig tree, um, slightly ragged looking, but still growing in its space on this lovely curved wall. And here we have a bit of English eccentricity, a pear house, a, a pear tree on a house in Yorkshire, um, carefully minding the windows and obviously rather interestingly starting in the next door neighbour's garden. It's been hijacked. And if you go to Scotland, um, to Mertoon, you'll see in the fig house this most beautiful, excellent piece of fig tree training. It can be done, it is done in Britain, but you need somebody like this. He is the fifth generation of gardeners to be on this one garden. When he's gone, I doubt if the fig tree will continue in its beauty, in the beauty that you've just seen. However, there is hope. Um, my husband grew this apple tree at Babington in Somerset. There is hope. Keep going. Thank you very much.